lecture six of the second section of this course on organic contaminants in the subsurface environment. We're dealing with the natural processes that are important within monitored natural attenuation. We've dealt with infection, dispersion, and retardation. We're now going to consider the last process called reaction. Reaction process is usually specific to the chemicals of interest and specific to the site. So it's the most difficult process to anticipate and perhaps to deal with. But I think it's probably the most important process in the success of monitored natural attenuation. The reactions can be non-biological or they can be biological. In many cases, for most contaminants, the biological processes are the most important. Again, that causes us some complexity because we're not biologists. And so we're uh, dependent on biology and trying to draw useful information from them without overstepping the limitations that they know to us. So let's look at chemical reactions. We'll start off with the non-biological processes first and then move to the biological processes. Well, we're working in a water environment, so hydrolysis, a reaction of the contaminant with water, must be important, or at least possible. Um, hydrolysis is often found to be catalyzed by high and low pH, by material in the aquifer, by a variety of other processes. So in fact, it's, it's quite complex and rather site-specific. Unfortunately, hydrolysis is rarely important. That is, it rarely occurs for the contaminants we're most interested in. Here's a table uh, drawn from a number of sources for chlorinated solvents, important chemicals uh, that we deal with. Um, you can see the half-life at uh, the laboratory temperatures, about 25 degrees centigrade, is indicated here. Half-lives of uh, hundreds or thousands of years aren't particularly useful to us. The reaction's too slow to be of significance. We're looking for chemicals that can undergo a reaction quickly with a short half-life. So these chlorinated solvents, it would appear that 111 trichloroethane would be a, a, a possible uh, chemical that could undergo hydrolysis. And also, uh, certainly 1122 tetrachloroethane. Uh, unfortunately, tetrachloroethane is not a common uh, product in our industrial society, so we don't encounter it in the subsurface. It's not because it reacts quickly, um, it's because it uh, is really not used very much. Uh, in terms of groundwater environmental protection, perhaps it would be interesting to uh, introduce that chemical instead of more persistent chemicals, uh, but that's really not, uh, not our, our call. But certainly 111 trichloroethane undergoes hydrolysis, and that reaction should be anticipated at every site that contains that chemical. Another reaction is elimination, where essentially we move a, a, a chloride or another halide uh, and cause a double carbon bond to form. And again, 111 TCA can undergo that reaction as well. And that reaction produces 1,1-DCE. Now, that's an important illustration of uh, the benefit or the liability of a reaction. Uh, certainly, that reaction is removing the target chemical, 1,1-1-TCA. But in all likelihood, it's producing a more toxic, uh, more soluble, more mobile chemical, 1,1-DCE. So in this case, the reaction may, in fact, not be beneficial for natural attenuation. Reductive dehalogenation can occur. Uh, it's also uh, commonly applied through uh, zero valent iron technologies as a, another remedial solution that we'll deal with later in this se section of the course. Uh, here's some information provided by an experienced consultant who deals with chlorinated solvents uh, uh, a lot. And these are the half-lives that he sort of uses based on the literature and some experience, but also listing the products of the reaction. And 111 TCA is quite interesting because 
the slower pathway produces 1,1 DCE. The faster pathway, the hydrolysis pathway, produces acetate. Now those products are very different in terms of their toxicities. Acetate is not very toxic, 1,1 DCE is. So when you see that reaction occurring, it's important to know how much is going on each pathway because one of the pathways is not very beneficial. And you can see the uh, products uh, of reaction of many of the other chlorinated solvents, um, few of which are fast enough to be of much use to us in natural attenuation. Probably half-lives of less than 10 or 20 years have some significance. Let's move on to the biological reactions, the microbiological processes. The subsurface is microbially active. It's dominantly bacteria. Uh, when I started in the profession, uh, people were concerned that uh, a few meters below the surface of the ground, the nutrients were so low that there wouldn't be any significant microbial activity. We now realize that's incorrect. Studies have happened. People have demonstrated that virtually all of the subsurface has some microbial activity. Some, of course, very specialized for the subsurface. Unfortunately, much of what we understand about biological processes comes from consideration of the near surface. So in many cases, we're extrapolating experience from near surface environments or wastewater treatment systems to the subsurface. And that translation is quite difficult. Most bacteria are, are attached, they can move, but generally people treat them as attached, so the contaminants and other material is flowing by the cell. Uh, the populations can be very diverse, the numbers of bacteria can range orders of magnitude. Uh, we've been unable to relate the numbers of organisms to some hydrogeological parameter like permeability or grain size. Uh, that would have been very handy. We could have avoided the difficult measurements of numbers of bacteria. Uh, we're advancing in the area of biodegradation uh, quite quickly in terms of the uh, techniques available to us to characterize the population, to uh, look for indicators that would suggest a population can degrade something. But we're really not moving ahead very far on our ability to predict the rate of degradation. And that's really the parameter we need within monitored natural attenuation. We need to know whether or not the contaminant will degrade, but we also then need to know if it degrades, what is the rate? And we're not advancing very far in that situation. Biological processes affect the redox condition, or they're affected by the redox condition. It's the chicken and the egg argument. Um, we recognize aerobic environments where oxygen is present, and in anaerobic environments, we often try to determine the major electron acceptor that might be being used by bacteria. So we recognize denitrification, um, sulfate reduction, iron reduction, and methanogenesis as a sequence of environments uh, going more and more anaerobic uh, in which the organic contaminant may be found. So in the anaerobic environment, we'd like to characterize it in terms of electron acceptors uh, and see if we can then uh, anticipate the rate of degradation uh, in that environment. Uh, we can treat the microbial reactions as simple chemical reactions. Uh, that's okay for a very first start, but we must realize the bacteria isn't conducting that degradation reaction for our benefit. For instance, the reaction of benzene with oxygen to produce CO2 in water is not really what the bacteria does. You have to ask, why would the bacteria want to eat benzene? Um, it does so mainly because it wants the carbon to build cell mass. So when you look at that equation, you don't see the cell mass uh, recorded. So we know that that equation is not accounting for the carbon in an accurate way. But it's a useful equation. If you wanted to know, is there enough oxygen available to degrade the contaminant, you can do a simple mass balance reaction like that and get an estimate of, well, it's obvious that there's enough oxygen or there probably isn't enough oxygen. Um, that's a good place to start. An area of particular interest is uh, reductive dehalogenation of chlorinated solvents. 
That uh, is a fairly recent uh, recognition uh, in our field that, in fact, this reaction does occur. Initially, we thought bacteria couldn't degrade chlorinated solvents. Now we find, of course, that there are bacteria that would do that quite willingly. And the reaction is usually um, a substitution of hydrogen for the chlorine, uh, and that brings about a dechlorination. A sequence of reactions is commonly found. In this case, it's 4-chlorinated ethene, uh, PCE, or tetrachloroethene, going to trichloroethene, dichloroethene, vinyl chloride, and finally to ethene. Ethene is fairly innocuous. All the rest of the contaminants uh, are somewhat toxic. Turns out that reaction one and two occur quite often in the subsurface under very anaerobic conditions. Reaction three seems to be less common under anaerobic conditions as is reaction four. Importantly, uh, we recognize that trichloroethylene actually degrades to a certain type of 1,1 DCE. Uh, it degrades most probably and most often to the isomer cis 1,2 DCE. So if we are looking for evidence in the field that TCE is degrading microbially, we often look for cis 1,2 DCE. Point out, however, there is literature that suggests that it's possible that in some cases in some bacterial communities, 1,1 DCE might be the, the product of degradation. So again, most of the time we anticipate cis 1,2 DCE as a product, but we have to be aware that other possibilities do exist. Well, we've seen 1,1 DCE before. Is it possible that at a field site, the 1,1 DCE we see does not come from TCE degradation, as suggested by this last reference. If we go back a few slides to the slide where we dealt with uh, elimination reaction, we see that there's a, a short half-life reaction whereby 1,1,1 TCA, trichloroethane, degrades to 1,1 DCE. So, we're now faced with the possibility, if we find 1,1 DCE, that it's coming from a non-biological degradation of 1,1,1 TCA, or it's coming from a biological degradation of TCE. That's a complexity we have to deal with, with these sorts of reactions. Many of the microbial reactions are very well understood. Here's an example of the degradation of toluene. There's a number of different pathways uh, catalyzed or facilitated by a number of, of uh, enzymes or plasmids, and you can see the breakdown products are quite well known. Question for us is, could we use the presence of some of those intermediates, like perhaps catechol, as evidence that toluene has degraded in our groundwater? Well, unfortunately, we can't. A number of reasons make that very difficult. First, catechol can be produced by many reactions of many chemicals. Secondly, the catechol is probably consumed faster than it's being produced, or as fast as it's being produced. Therefore, it's not present in any high concentration at any time. Uh, and in many of these breakdown products are just too difficult analytically to determine. So while we can appreciate the pathway, we're not able to make much use of them. Pathways are available from a database. It's upgraded. It covers a lot of contaminants. Here's the degradation pathway for naphthalene. Again, it shows us that we understand quite a bit about the process, but again, we're not able to apply this very well in groundwater. The last thing I want to say about microbial reactions is that from, from my experience and some experience of some of my colleagues, I produced a table. It's my table. Uh, it's not uh, reliable, I would say, but it's based on my experience. To indicate to you the limitations of my experience, let's consider this uh, one example of benzene degrading under nitrate reducing conditions. If you were to look in the literature for my name with that phrase, you would find two papers, one of which says benzene could degrade, and one of which says benzene doesn't degrade. So what do I know? This is the advisor 
who has two papers that provide contradictory information. And that's not unusual in this literature because the reactions are site specific. But in any event, you can see that the big yes means I'm fairly confident it happens. It would be my default assumption that it was occurring. Little yes says it likely happens, it could happen. Uh, a little no, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, question marks indicates that I'm really not very certain. A uh, small no means I think not, and a big no is I'm really comfortable it doesn't occur, and I would be very surprised. Uh, I would need quite a bit of evidence that it was occurring before I would accept it. And of course, the table can be expanded as you need for a number of chemicals. So we now dealt with all four of the um, processes that are important in monitoring natural attenuation. We've uh, looked at invection dispersion, re reaction and retardation. Uh, we realize that the last two are a bit more complicated. Um, and we'll show you some examples. And we'll show you how people might apply monitoring natural attenuation to some very simple field sites.